like this picture is because it's also a call to us to lift our, our hands and recognize the Lord and bring in our mind the, the, the presence uh, of the Lord. Two weeks ago, we talked about the power for living our life today, the activities of the Holy Spirit. But today I want to continue a bit in this one, but how do we measure our own spirituality? How do we recognize the activities of the Holy Spirit in me right now? Last time was more like as, as a church, the church history, the, the power of the Holy Spirit giving to each generation for service, the gifts of service. But today I want to see, uh, ask the question at the same time, what does a Christian look like? The image of the of, of a Christian. What characterizes a Christian today? And I was sharing the first service that uh, about two weeks before I got saved in 1978, I my wife and I we visited uh, her younger sister uh, who almost died. She was hospital and she just had received Jesus. And we walk in this hospital room, and you know, for the last nine, ten years, I had uh, rejected uh, church, and I walked away from God, and I went very, very down into uh, sin and everything. And before that, my only experience uh, regarding God was with the Catholic Church, was, was not a very close connection and personal connection with God. But that day, when I walked in this hospital room, I saw what was to me the first picture of what a Christian is like. And what I saw is a lady sitting in her hospital bed with a Bible in her hand a notebook and a small concordance in which she was searching scriptures and everything with a pen, I not forget the pen. So to me, it has marked me. This is what a Christian is like. Someone with a Bible, a pen, a notebook, and studying scriptures. And that has really impacted my, my, the beginning of my Christian life because uh, just after I got, uh, got saved, I was unemployed for a few months because my work was a seasonal work. So being unemployed and having seen the Christian with the Bible and a notebook and a concordance and a pen, guess what I did during the time that I was unemployed? I took my Bible, my concordance and my notebook and my pen and I filled up three full notebooks of different topics on love, faith, uh, angels, demons, uh, whatever it is that I could find in the Bible, I don't remember, but I filled in this winter three notebooks filled with scriptures. And you know what it led me to? The seven months later, I was still a baby Christian, seven months in the Lord. But uh, the Lord allowed me to participate to a mission trip in the province of Quebec and in an area where they had no evangelical church, Pentecostal church, very traditional. And I ended up being the translator of Bible school students and Bible school professors and musicians and everything. And I was the one translating and it was easy to translate. You know why? Because the Word of God had filled myself. I was filled with the Word of God. So when I came there, I just quoted scriptures. It just came out of my, my, my ears. It came out of uh, my eyes. It came out from my mouth. It's just like I was so filled with the Word of God because that's what I had done intensively for a few months. And I was so, so happy about that. So this morning I want to ask you, what does a Christian look like? And to you, because we want to bring it to, to ourselves, do you look like a Christian? <coughs> do you really look like Christ? Do we see more and more of Christ in your life today? If you have been a Christian for a long time, do we see more of Christ or less of Christ? Because unfortunately, it seems that we see less of Christ in many Christians as time goes, goes out. Uh, instead of seeing more and more of, of Christ. seems that there is a drifting, a drifting away. So, I want to restore and refresh and stir up this morning something that maybe is not uh, anymore in your life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. 
If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. The first, one of the first things that you probably notice in this text is the command to seek above and to set your minds above. And I think this is something already we need to start there. Are you right now, or have you been recently, or are you practicing this? Because this is what Paul is saying. If we want to have Christ-likeness, if we want to recognize the activities of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we need to have our mind set, our mind fixed, our mind absorbed by the things that are going where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. You know, Christ is sitting there. It's a place of honor. It's a place of authority. He is sitting right there in the presence of, of the Lord. And he presides and he has authority for you and he has everything that we need in our lives to help us. And other things that we uh, seem to be very strong in this text here is the connection between your mind and your spirituality. See that set your mind and you will be reflecting Christ in, all, in, in, in the world. And you know that uh, nowadays there's a lot in the science uh, field uh, of research about the brain, the brain of students, the, about the different sicknesses, about different behavior, about criminal behavior, and it seems that there's so many people studying the brain. And uh, there is a, a, a doctor, uh, um, uh, a doctor in, in uh, science here, Carol Dweck, who studied human motivation, especially for, for students in schools, the ones who are uh, really succeeding. Why are they succeeding? Why are st some students self-motivated? Why are they and others are not succeeding? And we have uh, uh, the next slide. Here And I don't want to preach psych psychiatry or psychology, but I just want to make a point that will lead somewhere here. And she examines the mindsets of people uh, that people use to guide their behavior. And we see here two different mindsets according to our studies. And if we think about it and we spiritualize it a little bit, you will recognize why. Just looking at this picture, why some Christians are not growing. Why some Christians are blocked and they are not making progress and developing to f live the, the abundant life and the potential that God has given them with the Holy Spirit and everything. It says here the, the fixed mindset. If you look at it, for, for instance, uh, they avoid challenges. They give up easily. They see efforts or discipline as useless. It's not worth the effort. They ignore uh, useful uh, feedback. They feel threatened by the success of others. And as a result, they don't grow as they could. These are describing the mindset of many people, of children and adults likewise. And we have Christians who would fit perfectly into this category. There's a challenge of faith, a price to pay. And no, it's, it's too hot, it's too rainy, it's too costly, it's not for me, and, and, and everything. Give up easily. The, the, not, the effort, the discipline, prayer, reading, it's, it's something, it's too hard. I, I, going to church on Sunday morning, eh, listening to the pastor, that's, that's all, that's enough for me. I'm not going to, to invest more of myself and everything. And if you look at all, all of this, you will see on that side here, another brain and different mindset and opening and a desire. There's a challenge, I can overcome it. Uh, there's a price to pay. It's worth it. I, I will grow through it. I'm learning from a defeat. I'm learning from a failure. I'm, I'm, I, can, I can overcome. And it's a completely different, different mindset. Let's go to the next uh, slide and go back to our scriptures of uh, looking as seek the things that are above and the seed. So you, you understand where I'm going a bit this morning. The connection between your mind and your spirituality. It's the, you, you cannot miss uh, this point. 
in the message itself, don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. And there's a lot of us, that's what we end up doing. We, we lose that beautiful scenery and that mindset of connection, connecting to, to Christ, where Christ presides and where he is king and where he rules the world and everything. And we are living uh, with or with our uh, difficulties and our burdens and our uh, hindrances and our own uh, limitations over here. So he says, uh, don't only go on eyes to the ground, absorb with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective and that's, that's what we need to do. You probably have heard this, the story of the farmer who captured a young eagle and kept it in his barn. Uh, locked in so, so he kept it from, from flying away. And uh, the eagle be, be, became uh, his behavior changed into a chicken, and he's uh, picking and you know and everything. So you see this beautiful eagle, but he's just acting like a chicken. And then a friend of his came one day and says, "Hey, this is this is sad. This is sad. Why do you keep this beautiful eagle? You should you should let him go." And so yeah, you're right. You should let him go. So they take the eagle, they put him outside, and the eagle. Don't even fly away. He's just picking, picking, continue to play. So finally, they, they put him on, on a higher ground where he could see above. And now it's like something clicked into him. And then he just whoosh, soared and up, up, up and away. And then he went and act like an eagle. And all. So, so that is what, what the Christians sometimes we, we are like. We were picking like chicken when we should be uh, an eagle. And then... Uh, yeah, so let's change that. Amen. <laughs> Who wants to be a chicken anyway? <laughs> so it seems that in this text, we emphasize the, the relationship with Christ. This is, this is your role, your place, your position, your life depend of your relationship to Christ. So get, get that, it's so, so important. There were uh, two sisters who enjoyed wild parties and uh, then they were converted and they received an invitation to a party and they sent their RSVP. We regret that we cannot attend because we recently died. They were dead to that life now. They were living for Christ. And that reminds me, uh, years ago, I met two girls just like that in my hometown. And they came, they came to party uh, that night. And I just came out of a village to evangelize. And uh, so I walked in front of the pizza restaurants and these two crazy girls, 16 years old girls, they're making signs, they're kind of laughing at people passing by and they're making fights in the, in the restaurant window and they're, they're saying like, do you recognize me? Do you recognize me? <laughs> Some kind of thing. So me, I just walked in and I went straight to their tables. I said, oh, my name is Renila, I sit at there. So to make the short story, a few hours later, they received Jesus. I took them to meet some fr Christian friends. And for a few hours, we just preach, preach, preach. And then they received Jesus. And that night, instead of going to the, to the parties, they became Christian. And then they returned to their village. They live in a small, small community. And they read the Bible one day. Uh, when you pray, they, uh, they, they, they read it wrongly. When you pray, do like the Pharisees do and go on the street corners and play, pray so that everybody will see you. So they went into their downtown, of the, it's not a downtown, it's a down village or whatever place they had, neither general store or whatever place they had. And they just knelt right there on the street and they started to, to pray. So anyway, that's just kind of things like that. But their life had changed. You can tell their life had changed. And all of this group of believers uh, are missionaries today. They are all evangelists and missionaries in different parts of, of, of the world. Do you remember the early days 
of your conversion, of your new life. You know, if you had a conversion, like a dramatic conversion, like or a strong, a strong moment of encounter with God, you have that experience of finding above something that was not there before, you didn't know about, you didn't care for, it was in total ignorance and darkness about what was, and then suddenly you just received Jesus Christ. I remember the night my conversion, I came to my mom, instead of going partying, they said, Mom, I'm born again. I didn't know exactly what it all meant, but I knew that I had been through something very special. And there was not enough hours in the day to read the Bible, to be with friends. There was not enough days in the, in the, uh, in the week to go to church. Like my, my church would meet five days a week, but the day that my church didn't meet, I, I drove to another town to go to church to the other town. You know, before I was a Christian, I was living crazy for the devil. I was in the world and I was completely walking in the world. When I became Christian, I did not become a half-hearted Christian. I became a radical Christian. And the things that are high above, I really love these things. And I search for these things. And the Bible says, seek. And the word seek means a verb of action. It's a required determination. Seek is not passive. You don't seek passively. You, you search for something. You search to understand. That's what it means here. You strive. You want to know what's happening there in the heavenlies. You, you know that Christ is there and you want that connection. You, you search for it. You want to know Christ and it is active. Uh, Christ is honored there. It's a conscious effort that requires discipline. It also engage our intellectual facilities, uh, faculties. We we, we must think about it. We receive something. We understand something. We accumulate knowledge. And we are being transformed by that knowledge. Uh, it requires discipline. is seeking. The second uh, uh, PowerPoint that I want to, to show you, these other pictures, about setting your mind. Keep thinking about the intellect, intellect uh, faculties. You see this text says, set your mind on things above. And you have two, two brain over here. You have the, the mind of Christ. It's filling with the connection. It's striving. It's, it's seeking. You receive something from, from heaven. You're thinking heaven. You, you receive something directly. And then you will see in the next few verses, there's a lot of uh, activities here that are uh, contrary to the character of Christ that is from the old life. And these things we are instructed, starting in verse 5, to put to death sexual sins. And we call it the sensual sins. There are two groups of sins in this text. Sensual sins this, that are appealing our impulse or passions or lust or greed. Sexual impure thoughts uh, and all kinds of things. And then you have another series of sins that are called the sensual sins, uh, the social sins, sins in relationship, sins that we have now a bit of indifference. You know, if you would find a Christian in this church practicing what we call the sensual sins, you would say, ah, this is horrible. This is not for a Christian. This is horrible. He's committing fornication. He's, he's like this, he's like that. And this is not acceptable. But then, then here, you will, how many times do you meet people with bad temper? <laughs> and it's not a big deal. You can be a deacon and have a bad temper. You can be, you know, doing like the double meaning jokes and everything. And it's kind of accepted more and more. It's not like so disturbing anymore. You see it on TV, you see it in conversation everywhere. But the, the Bible says that our mind has a direct connections with our spirituality and if we set our minds on what comes from Christ, what resembles Christ, what Christ is involved there, what is his objectives, what he wants to do, what is his goal for me and for society, I will be living that. I will be reflecting that. I will be living like him and glorifying him. But if my mind 
is, is you know picking down here and looking for the earthly members that the Bible says put to death these things and we are not putting it to death then our life is not going to grow it's like the, the two mindsets one is growing the other one is not is not growing so this is very important for us to to realize that you know just a minute <laughs> need to get my mind what is in my mind going to make a difference the Christian here it says not on things that are on the earth does that mean that Christians we should be only living up there you know that the Bible does not teach that the Bible is so so clear that we need to work as we are serving the Lord in our workplace how we are going to live in our homes and how we are going to be responsible in society to be respectful to the authorities to be obedient to be submissive and to functions in this in this society the, the Paul tells in the first Corinthians 7 I'm telling you you want to get married you can get married Welcome to the marriage life, but you will have the burdens of the marriage life. You will have the difficulties of the marriage life. You will be concerned to please your spouse, and you will have all the, 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 the burdens of that, you know. It's okay, you can do it, but you will have it. So, you, you, you choose what you want to do. And, uh, but the Bible says, you, you make a decision. You, you live it out. So we're not neglecting, like this week, yesterday, I called for some gas. I paid my electric bills. So I'm not, oh, I'm so safe now. I don't have to pay my electric bill anymore. You know, don't need to pay my income tax. I am now a higher, a higher government. I'm, I'm, I'm under God. I'm not under the, the law. No, the Bible says all of these responsibilities are important. But the, 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 the things that we are stressing here is that our goals have changed. We are not controlled by money. We are not controlled by our jobs. We don't become slave of these, these uh, appetites and these things that what pulls us over here. We have now a motivation higher. We have a goal. We use our work to bring someone to the Lord. We use a situation at the market to share our faith with someone. We, we try to, to bring Christ into every single thing that we do because our... Christ is in our mind. We, we, seek, we seek Him for the practical everyday responsibilities of life. We get our, res our directions from, from heaven. The Christian have their two feet on the ground. You know, sometimes we, we imagine, or some people give us the impressions that if you are a spiritual Christian, you are not really walking on the ground like everybody else. You're walking a little bit higher, like your language is, 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 is changed and everything. I, I was listening to a Christian comedian this week, uh, Michael Jr., that is talking about the... Uh, was that the oversaved Christians? He's describing the oversaved Christians, like, like you're you're talking about like uh, you lost your your keys and oh, seek the kingdom of God. You need the keys of heaven or something like that. <laughs> they will they will switch everything to everything as a spiritual like a prophecy and everything beware of people who are not walking on the same ground as where you are walking and uh, they have a direct connection with God and they, they have a prophet secret you know and they, they know better because you cannot tell them anything they will never listen to normal people uh, because uh, they have a direct connection with God beware stay away from people like that Christians and this is what we preach in this church here. True spirituality as the two feet solidly anchored on the ground. It's a practical Christianity that we preach in this church from its foundation until now. If it doesn't work at work, if it doesn't work at home, forget it. It's not good theology. Good theology is transformative. Good theology will be applicable. That's the message of this one, of Col Colossians. You want to be spiritual? It will be shown 
at home, it will be shown at work. Uh, your mind is connected there, for sure you will be Christ-like in every situation you have. But if you are not connected there, if you are earthly-minded, wow, beware. You might call yourself a Christian, but there will be, or sometimes it's not as drastic as this. There are many areas of our Christian life. We, we, we all have strength. And we have a better understanding in certain areas of our life than in others. So sometimes in certain areas we behave very well like Christians should. But in certain areas maybe we are not. So by connecting our mind to, to heaven where Christ presides, it will develop. It will first of all help us to realize and measure our spirituality and it will help us to strengthen the areas that we are not really doing so well with. Because sometimes we begin very well and we maintain it, but in certain areas we, we will fail later. So we need to reconnect with this. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 9, we talked about the sensual sins and we talked about the uh, social sins. We already talked about it. But, you know, many people, they don't like this text, this kind of text in modern church today because it is kind of negative. It talks about sin and it talks about behavior that is not acceptable, things that need to, we need to let go and we need to say no to these kind of things. And, and, and many churches today, all messages must be positive. Don't talk about negative. Give us positive doctrines. But in, throughout the Word of God, the truth the doctrines, the truths of the Bible are directly connected with the negative as well. The negatives come out of the truth of the Bible. And this is important for pastors and this is important for parents. Because if the pastor today is in modern churches, we cannot or dare not speak of sin today. Or what is sinful, what is ungodly, what will keep people from going to heaven. If we cannot talk about it anymore, if we don't dare to talk about it anymore because it's negative, we need grace, we need grace, we need to talk positive all the time. This is a lack of balance. There are people who will never be called to repent and to be changed and transformed and everything. So for the pastors, this is important that we bring the balance between the standards of God, of godliness, and also sometimes the, the hindrance, the, the problems of our humanity and what needs to get out of our life. And it needs to be talked openly and clearly. And it is true for parents. Parents, you cannot excuse ungodly behavior of your children because, oh, he's just a child. He's just a child, yes, but he needs to be corrected. He needs to learn, you know. So we, we, need, we need to practice that. If it is true for the pastors, it is true also for the, for the parents at home. We need to uh, identify. I know some, some children who have uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, and deficiencies, we can say, like a, a attention deficit or some kind of things like that. And uh, some parents will excuse, because of that uh, diagnostic at school, they will excuse all the ungodly behavior at home. Oh, uh, he's like that, and this is the children like this, this is how they behave and everything. But yes, we, we need to understand that, put it in perspective, balance it, but there is sin in his life. There is disobedience. There is rebellion. There is a hardening of sin. There is a lack of, of, res of respect and, and all of this. And then this child that needs to be addressed as well. So we need to keep things in perspective. And when we are connecting our mind with the desire of, of Christ, the standards of Christ, we will see the light. We will, we, it, will, it will appear more, more clearly and we will be, be able to live a life in balance. Because the Christian's spirituality is, pra is practical. It's practical for parents and it's practical for people in the workforce and it's practical for pastors uh, and the church uh, also. Here the idea is that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, there are some kind of uh, desire and appetites that will lead to actions. What is here? 
what is our appetites, what is our strong desire, our passions and everything, it will determine what we are going to do. You, you leave it there, it's important to you, you, you pursue these things, it will, it, will, it will do that. If you want to purify uh, your actions, you will have to purify your minds first, and otherwise it must. It talks about covetousness in all of these sins. And it says covetousness, which is an idolatry. Some texts, some Bible texts will see that all of these sins are an idolatry. And actually I, I tend to, to put all of these sins as an act of idolatry instead. Um, the message says, doing whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. You just you feel for it, you take it, you search for it, uh, and it is a life shaped by things and feelings and not a life uh, based on, on God. Covetousness is the sin of always wanting more. And when this is there, when it is in the mind, we never have enough. We'll never be content. We'll never be thankful because we have always something else to envy, something else to, to grab that belongs to somebody else of that society uh, present to, uh, to us. We will be envi envious of what other people have. A covetous person will dishonor someone else a covetous person will commit every other sin in order to satisfy that strong, strong desire, the sinful uh, desire. And un unfortunately, this sin is found also in churches. The funny thing is that if we ask ourselves, do believers in local church commit these kind of sins? You want to scream, no! No, for sure! You know? I was a youth director in, in Quebec for, for many years. I remember my first time I was uh, to, to, to face a, a, a reality that I never had met before. I was with an evangelist from Toronto and I was his translator in a huge uh, you, uh, youth conference. And at the end of the message, he says, okay, uh, close your eyes, everybody. Nobody look around uh, um, and don't raise your hands. But if you have been sexually abused, just look at me. I said, I, immediately in my mind, it was my first time, I'd never been in a meeting like that before. I says, what is he doing? This is a Christian, we are the Christians from all over the, the churches. <laughs> what is he doing? Like, I, I couldn't get it, you know? And then, gradually, one girl, Another one, tears in their eyes, they started to look ahead. I couldn't believe it. This is in the church. We're supposed to be Christ-like. And after that experience, I myself was often invited to many uh, family camps and uh, youth retreat all over the place. And I practiced this approach. And one time I was with uh, my friend, Pastor, one of my best friends, in a, a weekend for young people, and I, I did this call. And then one of the young ladies, she just screamed and cried, and ran out the door. Her dad, her, her grandpa, was molesting her, and he was the deacon of the church. So you see, this is not for church. This is the, what we have put off. And later on, and we, uh, we are running out of time, it, it, it continually <laughs> reminds us that you have put off these things. You have put on the new nature, which is true. And for a time, it seems that Christians may live a wonderful life, a life of victory, but you never know in time Five years later, down the road, three years, two years, meeting people, meeting temptation, meeting events, meeting in different kinds of uh, influence. What's going to happen at the moment when they face certain decision? If the mind is filled with Jesus Christ, you go through that successfully. If the mind is not, 
in its fill of the sensual sins or filled by something else, it will also show and it will also affect the life of other people because this is, this is how it works. Chapter, uh, verse 9 and 10 says, put off and put on. And I want to close with this. The renewal that is necessary and why we need to look up there. When it says, you have put off the old self, the verb is in the past. <coughs> it's been done. Jesus Christ gave you a new life. This old life is finished. The Holy Spirit came to live in you. You have put on the new. It's been done. The verb is, it's past. It's been done. But there is another verb that comes just after that. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed. So there's something that's not finished there. There's something that you and I need to be continually being renewed, reconnected. And there's only one way that we can be renewed in that way. It is through going back and seeking. It is going back to setting our minds where Christ is. And it says here, renewed and knowledge. And we don't talk here about empiric knowledge, about theological. There's theological schools, Bible schools and churches filled of people with empiric knowledge, theological knowledge that do not live the Christian life. That do not reflect Christ and their, and their behavior. So it's not that knowledge we're talking about. It is the knowledge that will come into your life when you are seeking, striving to understand, to connect with Him. When you are setting our minds, I want that life. I want to be that kind of Christian. I want to live like the Christian ought to be. And not only to allow myself to drift away through the years and harden myself and getting like a church goer. Either I'm going to live a life for Christ or I'm just, I don't know what I'm going to happen uh, into my life. So how do, does this re renewal come? It is not through the, the knowledge of the mind. It is through the personal knowledge of Christ that is progressively uh, going up. That's why setting on affections upwards, we will progressively become like Jesus Christ. Amen? There's a, a Barna study, verse 12 to 15, talks about some things that, again, this, the picture of the clothing, clothes yourself with. And these qualities are the character of Christ. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And this Barna study asked people, Barna is like a, an organization that does statistics on churches, church life, the, what's going on in the religious world. And they asked people to use single words to describe Jesus. And people who responded said, wise, accepting, compassionate, gracious, and humble. And out of that, we realize that there is a difference between knowing about the good news and being the evidence of the good news. It's different because after this, this uh, statistics here, uh, they describe Christ with certain qualities and then when they talk about the church, it says they are judgmental, they are like this, they are like, and all the, the, the qualities that they apply to the church are negative qualities. But when they talk about Christ, they, 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 they have a good, good idea about Christ. So it, it reminds us that if we want to reflect Christ, we need to do certain things. And in closing, chapter uh, verse 16 and 17, we talk about one thing that is necessary, essential. It's let the word of God richly dwell in you, abundantly. And what it means here is like, it's like a house, and it's let the word of God occupy fully the house. The attics, the basements, all the rooms, 
every square inch of this house. Let the word of God fill it up. You know, in our in our life, our life is consistent. So many, uh, so many things, so many areas, so many decisions, so many uh, uh, psychological, emotional, socials, and everything like uh, responsibilities, burden, decision making. So let the word of God have its, its role, its, its answer, its wisdom, its practical help, and to that it will occupy the full house, uh, the full house of who you are, who you are called uh, to be. So, the, and there is a, a parallel text in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Colossians, the same parallel passage is, be filled with the Word of God. But the result of both are the same. And this is exactly where we're going. Joy, thanksgiving, and submission, submission to God. So I want to close with the last picture. How do you measure spiritually? And maybe you can stand with me this morning. I'm, I'm, skipping, I'm skipping stuff, but I think you got the main, the main ideas. Look at this text here uh, quietly just for a moment. What's your mindset? How do you measure up your own spirituality? Is your mindset 